Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Thursday lunchtime lecture from us here at the Church Conservation Trust. You will see today that I am not in my usual location. I'm not joined by my usual friend, Clement. Um, the reason for that is that we're doing some tech testing this afternoon and I needed to be in the London office. And I have to say, it is so nice to get out of um, the house and back into the office. Um, so a very special welcome to everyone joining us today. Um, do let us know if you're joining us for the very first time or if you're a repeat um, viewer, um, let us know and do let us know where you are joining us from. But it's great to have you with us today. As is the custom with these lunchtime lectures, um, the first 10 minutes we dedicate to Church of the Week, which is where we talk about Pacific Church in the care of us here at the Church Conservation Trust, which in some way is connected to a topic um, or this week's topic. So without any further delay, I'm gonna pass you over to our Chief Executive, Peter Ayres, who's going to tell you about this week's Church of the Week. Over to you, Peter. Thank you, George, and hello, everybody. And uh, please expect the customary fumbling around as I try to share my screen. Uh, we'll get there in the end. I think I'm getting better at it, actually. That's my, my view. Uh, and I hope you can see that now. So, first of all, let's always, as always, thank Ecclesiastical Insurance, who are sponsoring Church of the Week and uh, for their support in general for the lunchtime lectures. Now, today's offering is a real Suffolk gem, and it's one that I have had the real pleasure of visiting many, many times. It is St Mary the Virgin in Redgrave. This church was built in the mid 14th century, probably on the site of a Saxon church mentioned in the Doomsday Book of 1086. It was built by the abbots of the Benedictine Abbey of St Edmundsbury, to whom the manor had been given by Ulfketel. You see, this is where I get the pronunciations all wrong. He was the Earl of East Anglia in circa 1005. And I'm sure all those East Anglians can correct my pronunciations. The, re the name Redgrave is derived from the Anglo-Saxon meaning reed ditch and Saxon pottery has been found in a field near the church. This may have been the site of the Saxon hall and could be the reason for the location of the church outside the present village. The abbots of Bury were lords of the manor of Redgrave until the Reformation. Thomas Wolsey of Wolf Hall fame was rector here in 1506, but there's no record that he ever came to Redgrave. Nicholas Bacon purchased the manor and started to build Redgrave Hall in 1545. He was made Lord Keeper of the Seal by Elizabeth I in 1558 and knighted at about the same time. His son, another Nicholas, was knighted by James I in 1611 as Premier Baronet of England. So this church, as you can see, has some pretty high profile connections. The parishes of Redgrave and Bosdale were united with Rickinghall in 1975 to become the benefice of, of Redgrave come Bottesdale with the, with the Rickinghalls. That's a pretty catchy title if there ever was one. St Mary's Rickinghall Superior was made redundant in 1977 and vested into our care, although Rickinghall Inferior Church is still in use. St Mary's Redgrave was declared pastoral redundant by the Church of England on the 1st of April 2005 and the church was vested in the Church's Conservation Trust on the 1st of October the, the same year because of its very significant historic value and interest. We made repairs to the building to make it waterproof in 2006 including restoration of the glass in the east window and repairs to the pinnacles of the tower. Steel grills have replaced the broken wooden louvers in the tower to exclude pigeons. And here you can see some of our repair works. Also at the same time, the, um, the local friends of St Mary's Redgrave did a huge amount of work to make sure that toilets were installed in the building at the same time uh, and that it could be used for functions and events. Uh, they did some good work digging trenches and making all this stuff work at, this, at the same time. The east window of Redgrave is a real treat to see with its jewel-like colours and intricate tracery. The stained glass in the east window was given by E.P. Blake in 1853 and was made by Farrier of Dis. Inside, the church is very light and spacious. The arcades are 14th century with piers of quatrefoil section with narrow shafts to match the chancel arch. The nave root dates from the 15th century with alternating hammer beams and arch braces, above which are braced queen posts. Like many of our churches, there are fine monuments in this building, including the effigies of Sir Nicholas Bacon, Premier Baronet of James I and his wife Anne. A tomb had already been built at the east end of the North Isle by Sir Nicholas Bacon, the son of the Lord Keeper, for his wife in 1616. 
The tomb was made by Bernard Jansen, the king's engineer. After Sir Nicholas's death in 1624, his son, Sir Edmund Bacon, commissioned Nicholas Stone, later who, to become the, the royal stonemason, to carve the effigies of both of his parents in white marble and to be placed on the tomb at a cost of £200. The church is home to a finely decorated octagonal font that dates to the 14th century and, rather, and also a rather mag majestic organ built in memory of Lucy Wilson. It was made by Casson and Company in 1890. This replaced the earlier organ made by Joseph Hart of Redgrave in 1842, which stood on a gallery now removed at the west end of the church. Now, time for something a little macabre. The following was written in the Eastern Daily Press on the 13th of July, 2010. It had remained hidden for centuries, but the entrance to a 500-year-old vault beneath a medieval Suffolk church had been, has been discovered after a woman accidentally stamped her foot through one of the floor tiles. While rehearsing a scene for an upcoming performance of the musical Quasimodo at St Mary's Church in Redgrave near Dis, actor Cathy Mills dislodged a marble flagstone near the altar and her foot disappeared into the dark void below. Mrs Mills, who is in her 60s, suffered a swollen ankle, but the pain soon subsided when she was told later she'd uncovered a tomb never seen in living memory, with coffins inside suspected to contain the remains of the village's past aristocracy. Well, what's really interesting about this is today's guest lecturer, Dr Julian Litton, even visited Discovery and he remarked, I quote, Seeing this as a is seeing this is as rare as hen's teeth. It is a fantastic thing to see. You don't get to see these things very often. Well, if that's a lead into our lecture today, uh, let me hand you back to George. But that was that was Church of the Week, St Mary's Redgrave. Thank you so much, Peter. And I hope everyone now I've seen some really interesting comments from people coming saying this is a church that you're going to go and visit. Um, please do go and visit it. And I see someone's commented um, that they're also hoping to go and see Stanton. Do go and visit Stanton as well. It's in our care, um, the ruins of Stanton Church. And I used to live in Stanton when I was a little boy. So, um, yeah, I recommend that you go and visit both of those churches, as well as Rickon Hall um, Superior, which is um, the very first CCT church that I rang bells at. So um, do go and visit those churches. So, Peter, we've got a couple of minutes, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions, if that's OK. Um, you talked about the vesting repairs. And at the moment, we've got our annual appeal looking at heritage craft skills. During the vesting of our churches, how important is it that we use craft skills? What kind of skills do we look for um, and utilize um, in conserving our church? You mentioned something about um, the pinnacles at Redgrave, but also the, the glass. Do we use these traditional skills in those kind of conservation um, projects? Uh, absolutely. They're fundamental to how you repair these and conserve these buildings. So uh, history, well, I mean, we have a hugely knowledgeable uh, following. Uh, so uh, apologies if, if it seems that I'm uh, telling you things you already know. But historic buildings are really special in that they work as a system and all the parts of them work together to make sure that they're waterproof, really. And water is the great enemy of these buildings. Uh, they're very beautiful as well, but they're, they're, they're constructed to shed, uh, shed water and also to stay upright or fight gravity. But um, what's really fundamental to that is things like lime mortar. So lime mortar is very different from cement mortars that you see in modern buildings because lime mortars allow buildings to breathe. So modern buildings are designed to keep water out and keep water away from buildings. Historic buildings are generally designed to take moisture on, but also to be able to expel it. So uh, a historic building in its very essence breathes. Uh, that's what happens. Uh, it respires. It's, it's an interesting concept and quite difficult for people to grasp sometimes. But the masonry, the lime mortars, the timber, the lead covering or whatever roof covering you've got together all work together uh, to make sure that the building can uh, sort of take moisture on, but then expel it as well. And, and problems always occur when too much moisture gets into the building, which causes rot, it causes um, damage to the stonework, et cetera, et cetera. Now, in order to do that, you need craftspeople who understand the system of how these buildings work and they have the skills to uh, to do the carving and the care and attention. Now, it's very important. The skills are really important, but there's a mindset associated with this as well. What do you do? What do you keep? 
what do you replace and you have to be very careful about that and you have to get the right people with the right set of skills and the right mindset to to work out how to do this now there's some very specialist things as well as george you referred to uh, such as stained glass repair and conservation this is a highly skilled area uh, that not just any any old person can do so we use a whole range of people from sort of general builders but who have conservation skills they understand how historic buildings work right through to highly specialized skills of very specialist stonemasons carpenters uh, glass um, conservators and and many other things that are in the buildings of like monuments for instance thanks peter i'm going to squeeze in another quick question next so i'm obviously just talking about conservation and obviously our title is the church's conservation trust but um what separates us from other organizations and because we have a particular emphasis on empowering communities don't we and sort of when we take on a new church we do a lot of work to involve the local community and take them with, on that journey and into bringing the church back to life don't we absolutely i uh, so what's what I, I have this complete view that that, that, that well, everyone takes pictures of churches that are empty I, I i'm they're obsessed with empty churches every picture you see empty empty it's deeply ironic because these buildings are built for people to do stuff in that's their whole function uh, there's obviously they're built for the greater glory of god but actually they are for humans to move around in and undertake ritual and activity in those particular buildings. And so uh, what I'm very keen to see is that communities occupy these spaces and use them and people visit them. So we keep our doors open and we also work very hard with local communities and anyone who's interested in those buildings to make sure that there's a group of people who will use and love these buildings. It's not a Christian mission. This is about these buildings are testament to the, the place where they are and they have a really important bond and as you've heard me say many times before they're the most democratic of historic buildings uh, because they're there for absolutely everybody regardless of what you believe where you come from uh, gender sexuality doesn't matter this building is there for you and you should have access to it and I'm uh, we're on a mission to make sure that we can access as, as much support for these fantastic buildings uh, across the country as possible so we've invested in staff who are out there trying to support the communities who who love these buildings and get them used uh, for a wide variety of functions sometimes Christian worship but uh, gin festivals beer festivals farmers markets theatre music there there's a whole plethora of things that they can be used for. Thanks, Peter. And um, everyone, um, you've just heard there from Peter, we, you know, if you want to get involved, you can get involved. So if you'd like to volunteer with us, um, you can find out about how to volunteer with us. Um, we are actively looking for new volunteers. So do go to our website, which is www.visitchurches.org.uk and you can find out about volunteering with us. But also if you'd like to support us in um, sustaining heritage craft skills and keeping these skills alive, um, you can learn more about our annual appeal on our website as well. That brings um, a conclusion to this week's Church of the Week. Now, there's a lot of comments coming through about Clement looks different today. <laughs> I'm not going to introduce um, Shana today. But, um, Shana, do you want to tell people why you were sat next to me today? Um, oh, thank you. That's really made me giggle that. Um, yeah, I'm not, un unlike Clement, I'm not going to fall asleep. And, and make funny noises, well, I hope not. Um, but no, I'm here today so that George can eventually have a holiday because he's been working so hard on these lectures and he has all these skills. And so he's teaching me today um, how to do all the technical stuff behind the scenes. So, so I'm Shana James, I, I work with George on the comms team. So yes, we're here in the London office and Clement is fine, by the way. He's just, um, he's having a day. Day off, home. yeah. Well, there you go, everyone. So don't worry, Clement will be making a return next week. Um, but we're going to kick off the lecture very shortly. But as always, um, these lectures are completely free of charge. If you see anyone commenting with any links telling you to watch them elsewhere, please don't click them. These lectures are always free of charge. Um, you can catch up on any of our lectures. So we've been doing them every week for over a year now, um, can you believe? And you can watch all of those um, recordings completely free of charge either on YouTube, on our Facebook page, and we'll post a link um, to our Facebook playlist. Now, if you'd like to support us and gain access to um, these lectures and um, also to our member exclusive lectures that we launched a couple of months ago, um, you can do that in a couple of ways. So firstly, 
Um, if you become a member with us um, by direct debit from just £3.50 a month, you'll get invitation to these exclusive lectures that I've just mentioned. Um, but also, it allows you to have a deeper relationship with us and really journey with us in saving historic churches around the country. But as I said, if you join us by direct debit and use the offer code lecture, and that's the word lecture in capitals, you'll get a free copy of this book. Um, which hopefully you can all see that. So this is the decoding secret language of churches and cathedrals, um, written by um, Dr. Richard Stemp, a previous lecturer of ours. Um, this is hot off the printing press. They only arrived, um, I believe, just, um, they were shipped out last week. And I know lots of people have already received their copy of this. And I see people are commenting away, saying how much they like this book. So if you have received it and like it, do comment away and let other people know how great this book is. But um, as I said, if you're drawn by direct debit, just £3.50 a month, you will get a free copy of this. Now, if you just like to buy this book, um, I'm pleased to say that you can now do so. Um, you can, it's £16 plus post and packaging, and I'll post the link shortly for where you can buy it, buy it on our website. Um, there's also other books on our website um, at really fantastic prices. So do have a look at our other collection of books there. That's enough from me this morning, but I'm gonna pass you back to Peter, who is going to introduce this week's guest lecturer. Thank you, George, and uh, thank you to all those people who have joined us. And uh, don't forget, we have that offer on to get that book for free, which is great. And we rely on your support uh, to take forward this mission to save historic churches right across England. Um, and you can see there's there's quite a need for that, so potentially. So uh, all your support is gratefully received. Now we have a real treat today, and I'm really, really humbled to have. Uh, we've got Dr. Uh, Julian Lytton with us, um, uh, a, a fantastic guy who's uh, extremely knowledgeable and he's a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries in London, a fellow of the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland, a member of the Royal Archaeological Institute and he's been a member of the Westminster Abbey Fabric Commission since 1993, of the Fabric Committee of Ely Cathedral since 1999, he's chairman of the Norwich Cathedral Fabric Advisory Committee which he's been on since 2010 and chairman of St Edwinsbury Cathedral Fabric Advisory Committee since 2015. I hope that gives a, a good sense of his pedigree. Uh, is very much in demand uh, and uh, extremely, extremely knowledgeable, as I said. He's also the Vice President of the Church Monument Society, who we've been working with over this lecture series, and we've been very grateful for their support. And he's also Chairman of the Legerstone Survey of England and Wales, which uh, we were just discussing previously. The CCT was very much part of uh, in the early days of it. So without further ado, let me hand you over to Julian Litton. And, Julian, thank you very much for doing this lecture for, welcome, us, uh, for free. Uh, we're extremely grateful. And over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Now, what I might have to tell people is that I am a techno prat. And there's every possibility, well, rather than possibility, there's an assurance that George is going to have to help me out in getting the, um, the PowerPoint presentation up on screen. George, shall we try and see what we can do? <clears throat> Now, I think I have to press share screen, do I? Thank you. Then I highlight the PowerPoint. Then I press share screen again. We're there, hooray. Now I hope everybody can, can see that. I'm encouraged, thank you very much. If your church was built before 1800, there's every possibility that it contains at least one ledger stone those large black marble slabs set into the floor, inscribed with the names of those deposited in the brick grave beneath. Some can be highly decorative, incorporating the deceased's armorial bearings. Others might have a funerary motif, such as a death's head or a winged hourglass, though the majority tend to be a simply inscribed legend, hence the word ledger, without any attendant relief sculpture. But whatever form they take, their genealogical information is of paramount importance. Well, so much for the, the trailer. Julian, what I'd like to do now, oh, George. Um, do you want to just click slideshow and go from current slide so it goes full screen for everyone? Right, shall we do that? Shall we slideshow, which is where? Ah, right. Do I have to stop? My screen. Oh, no, 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 keep sharing, but it's that slideshow button on the top bar between animations and review. Between animations and review. Try to find it. I cannot see it. I ah, between animation and slideshow. That's it. And from current slide. 
And let's see, form current from current slide. Excellent. How does that look? Perfect. I'm glad to hear it. Right, good. Let's hope it's going to work when slide three goes up. Well, so much for the trailer. And what I'd like to do now is to take you through the establishment of the ledger stone, how it came to be a fashionable form of commemoration and their historical importance. But be assured, this will be an enthusiast's guide rather than that of a ledger stone anorak. As my PhD supervisor once said to me, tell them what they need to know, not what you know. Wise advice. And so I shall adhere to his directive. As a rule of thumb, ledger stones began appearing in churches in the 1620s. However, it was during the Commonwealth, 1649 to 1660, when faculty jurisdiction was suspended and that the middle classes looked to the interior of their parish church as a place of secure burial, soliciting permission from the incumbent, the individual deemed the more worthy arbiter as to whom was and who was not a suitable candidate for such a privilege. But as with many other privileges, intramural burial came at a cost. For the construction of a single width brick grave was an expensive exercise. More so if it was to be double width, more popularly described as a vault, as was the provision of the ceiling stone, the ledger. With the restoration of the monarchy in 1660 and the return of the faculty jurisdiction, the practice of intramural burial was so established that the ecclesiastical authorities thought it best not to interfere apart from making it mandatory that a faculty be required for the creation of brick graves and vaults and for the laying of a ledger stone, though in practice, few such faculties were ever applied for, as you'll soon find out. And so the system of intramural burial continued until 1857, when the new Burial Act forbade further corporeal burials within Anglican churches, though allowing it to continue in existing vaults and brick graves where space permitted. Unfortunately, ledger stones have generally gone unrecorded, and many of them have been rendered illegible by centuries of feet shuffling over them. Others have been lost by accidental damage or have been ruthlessly removed during restoration work. Furthermore, many are now hidden under pew plinths, such as those of the Bag family in the chancel South Isle at the Trust's Church of St Nicholas Kingsley in Norfolk. On the other hand, funerary monuments and memorial brasses have been more attractive to historians and antiquarians, while churchyard headstones have a quality of interest to genealogists, but ledger stones, which are often important for their incise calligraphy and the biographical details of those whom they record, have generally lost out when it comes to funerary studies. As for the ledger stone, some parish churches have none at all, and the little church at Kelvin in Essex has only two, whereas others, such as Bath Abbey has 891, and the aforementioned St Nicholas King's Lynn has 210. The church of St Augustine the Less Bristol was almost paved with them, as you can see from this illustration of the building during its archaeological excavation in the 1980s. And you can forget Pevsner and Arthur Mee, for neither of them had any interest in ledger stones at all. And sadly, the same can be said of John Betjeman. It has been estimated that there are about 300,000 ledgers left in England and Wales out of an estimate of 750,000. Thus the formation of the Ledger Zone Survey of England and Wales in 2002 was not before time. It's now administered by the Church Recording Society. And the survey involves a number of stakeholders, Historic England, SPAB, the National Churches Trust, Churches Conservation Trust, the Cathedrals and Church Buildings Division of the Archbishop's Council, the Scouting Association, and the Duke of Edinburgh's Awards Scheme. The aim of the Society and the survey is to visit every church in England and Wales, conformist as well as nonconformist, to map, record, measure, and photograph every accessible ledger. 
At present, it is considered that the project will take 75 years to complete, which is 25 years less than the Monumental Brass Society took to record all of England's monumental brasses. However, it may well be that the Legerstone Society's project will never be completed until the floors beneath pew and choir stall plinths have been examined and every fixed and fitted carpet has been uplifted and delivered to the skip where, in my opinion, they so rightly belong. Of course, there are some ledgers which are known to have been turfed out into the churchyard during a restoration programme, as happened at Great Massingham, Norfolk in 1863, when the architect Daniel Penning of Eyre restored the building. They now lie in rows in the churchyard at the east end of the chancel. But as the survey only concerns itself with ledgers still in situ within the building, those at Great Massingham, as with elsewhere, fall outside the recording programme. This recording will be easy in Saffron Walden, Essex, where all of their ledger stones uh, were shifted in 1859 to the west end of the building during the restoration program undertaken by R.C. Hussey, as shown in this excellent image uh, of the 1940s by Edwin Smith. And again, also photographed by Edwin Smith, the reordering at Klein, Norfolk in 1849 by Samuel Saunders Tunan, who also repositioned the ledgers at the west end of the church, but this time on a north-south axis. We shall never know precisely how many bodies have been buried in churches, for burial registers were not introduced until 1538. Few of those registers give the location of the burial, unless it was to be in a large dynastic vault of a noble family, such as in his lordship's vault. And for some time, I had wondered whether or not there was a system in parish registers whereby one could identify those buried in the churchyard and those within the church. And as part of my PhD researches in the late 1980s, I visited 30 churches in each of the counties of Essex and Somerset, recording the ledger stones and looking up in the burial registers the names of those inscribed on them. And from this sample, it was deduced that a coded system was indeed in use, whereby those buried within the confines of the church had all been given a title of courtesy, whereas those buried in the churchyard had not. Thus, a Mr. John Smith or John Smith Esquire would have been buried within the church, whereas John Smith, pure and simple, was in the churchyard. Even infants were so recorded. The burial of two-year-old Elizabeth Prowse in Axbridge Church, Somerset, in March 1746, appears in the burial register as Mrs. Elizabeth, daughter of Thomas Prowse Esquire. But in this case, the Mrs. is an abbreviation of the form mistress or miss. Similarly, at Thaxted, Essex, a Mrs. Mary Philbridge, aged 54 years, was buried in that church in June 1765, to be followed by a Mrs. Elizabeth Philbridge, aged 66, in the same grave in September 1775. In actuality, they were wealthy sister spinsters who lived a quiet and genteel life in the town and now lie beneath a black marble ledger in the chancel North Isle. Dr. Roger Bowdler, the former head of listing at Historic England, uh, and also a member of the Ledger Stone Council said, Ledger Stones are the most valuable genealogical, genealogical record after parish records, yet they are still treated as the ugly ducklings of church memorials. For too long, they have been walked on and ignored. Well, so far, we've learned that burial within the confines of the parish church was seen as a mark of social distinction increasingly adopted by secular society after the Reformation, but becoming far more important during the Commonwealth when all matters concerning faculties were deposited in the dustbin, thus giving a free-for-all on the part of those who considered themselves to be of importance. The nobility and some of the landed gentry appear to have regarded intramural burial as their right, but by the middle of the 17th century, the professional classes 
regarded it as the culmination to a successful career. The upper echelons of mid 18th century society regarded the concept of intramural burial in its stride. But by the end of the century, space within churches, particularly those in the cities and towns, was declining. And the situation was only saved by the establishment of the private joint stock cemetery companies, such as that opened in 1833 at Kensal Green, resembling a small private park. These cemeteries were established by gentlemen, invested in by gentlemen, run by gentlemen, and seen as a gentleman's solution to the unavailability of burial space in churches. It was in such private cemeteries with their expansive acres of consecrated land that large plots, larger than any parish church could possibly grant, might be purchased for the construction of a mausoleum, a spacious vault, or the erection of large monuments, the attractiveness being that all plots were sold as freehold absolute. In short, it was their exclusivity and the right of freehold which made them popular to the upper classes. Furthermore, this popularity captured the interest and imagination of central government, which led to the Metropolitan Interments Act of 1850, which forbade further burial within the churches of the cities of London and Westminster, and empowered local authorities to establish garden cemeteries within their own boroughs, a system which extended nationwide under the Burial Act of 1857. And now to the legal bit. Because the soil and freehold of the church is in the parson alone, and that the church is not, as the churchyard is, a common burial place for all the parishioners, the church wardens, or ordinary himself, cannot grant license of burying to any person within the church, but only the rector as the incumbent thereof. This observation made by the Reverend Dr. William Watson in his book, The Clergyman's Law in 1747, neatly summarizes the common understanding amongst the ecclesiastical authorities of the Church of England on the matter of intramural burial. Watson's contemporary, the Reverend Dr. Edwin Gibson, elucidated further in his 1761 publication, Codes Juris Ecclesiastici Anglicani, that it was the parson, quote, not as having the freehold, or at least not in that respect alone, but in his general capacity of incumbent, as the person in whom the ecclesiastical laws appointed the judge of the fitness or unfitness of this or that person to have the favour of being buried in the church, unquote. Burial law was an important matter, as there was vast privilege associated with the possession of a vault or brick grave within the parish church, for it established the owner's position in the social hierarchy of the village or town. While the privilege of intramural burial lay, then with the gift of the incumbent, it was illegal for him to remove any funerary monument or ledger stone in order to create space for burial. Similarly, it was illegal for him to allow for the removal of bodies for the same purpose, as it was deemed that once buried, a body could not be taken up without a license from the superior ordinary, that is to say, from the bishop of the diocese. Now, there's a most notorious instance of such a case, which took place in 1853, when Sir John Wallio of Ketteringham, Norfolk, received the bishop's permission to remove the remains of the Atkins family from the manorial vault within the church to the churchyard for burial, so that Sir John, as the new owner of Ketteringham Hall and therefore Lord of the Manor, could take over the vault for his own use. And shortly after this had been done, a member of the Atkins family protested, with the result that the remains had to be exhumed and returned to the vault, and Sir John was reduced to the embarrassment of constructing a mausoleum in the churchyard for his family and himself. On the other hand, in cathedrals, it was the dean who operated as the ordinary in respect of the freehold rights and to whom application for intramural burial needed to be made. As a collegiate church, the cathedral's jurisdiction differed from those of a parish church in that 
uh, as it was the matrix ecclesia, it was governed by its own statutes. Intramural burial within a cathedral could be an expensive venture, and an account made in 1706 by the Reverend Dr. Claver Morris of Wells, Somerset, relating to the death of his three-year-old daughter, Molly, describes how expensive this venture could be. Molly Morris died on the 18th of December, 1706, and was buried in the cathedral church at Wells, betwixt the chapel of Our Lady and the altar of the choir, exactly in the middle before the door that goes up behind the altar and as near it, as, as it can conveniently be on the 23rd of December. This then gave but three days for the construction of the brick grave. Fortunately, the ledger stone survives, precisely in the location described by Morris and of sufficient length and width to cover a full-size adult grave and in which both Dr. Morris and his wife were subsequently deposited. The expenditure for the works were as follows. For breaking the ground, one pound, six shillings and eight pence. For making, which means digging the grave, six shillings and eight pence. For sinking it, so the body lies six foot, five inches deep, two pounds, four shillings and ten pence. To Richard Simmons for walling, paving and plastering the grave, five shillings. To James Allen for cutting the inscription on the freestone that closed the grave, one shilling. And to Thomas Parfit for the coffin and stuff that faced it and lined it, 16 shillings. The standard fee payable to church wardens for breaking the ground within a parish church was 10 shillings and sixpence, about 52 pence. But Morris was willing to pay one and a half times that amount for space within the diocesan cathedral. In all, he laid out five pounds, one shilling and tuppence for his daughter's burial whereas an earth burial in the churchyard at that time would have cost one pound, one shilling, inclusive of fees, grave digger and coffin. Many qualities of individual sought intramural burial in parish churches during the 18th century. Doctors, apothecaries, solicitors, high ranking military and naval personnel and gentlefolk who relied on private incomes provided many a town and city incumbent with a steady stream of inquiries in an age where wealth, as well as birth, became the yardstick of rank. But to what purpose, one might ask? Whilst the outward and visible pomp of the funeral was indicative of the, to the onlooker of the status in society the deceased had occupied during his or her lifetime, the corpse within the coffin was oblivious of the spectacle generated even though they might have been responsible for stipulating and financing the extent of panoply. In general, ledger stones seem always to have been given scant regard by church wardens. In 1764, the antiquary Rafe Bigland was to lament. Many gravestones are often half and other wholly covered with pews, and many are also broken, and by the sinking of graves, not only inscriptions are lost, but the beauty of the church defaced. All these and many other evils might be remedied in case every parish was obliged to have in like manner as abroad, a monumental book to keep with the register wherein every inscription should be fairly written under the inspection of the minister officiating for which purpose a fee should be paid. Nor would it be amiss if every parish had the ignography of the church on a large scale with proper references to each person's grave or family vault. This ought especially to be done when any old church is repaired or pulled down in order to be rebuilt. Well, had this been adopted, then the work of the Legerstone Survey of England and Wales would be much lessened. And I'm afraid to say his advice fell on deaf ears. On the other side of the coin, the diarist John Evelyn, writing in 1683, recalled his father's disgust with the novel custom of burying every body within the body of the church and chancel as a favour heretofore granted only to martyrs and great princes. The excess of making churches charnel houses being of ill and irreverent example and prejudicial to the health of them living, besides the continual disturbance of the pavement and the seats 
the ground sinking as the carcasses consume. Well, I suppose he had an argument that the system could indeed be prejudicial to the health of the living, particularly when the funeral furniture omitted to provide an inner lead coffin and bricklayers made a faulty job of setting the ledger stones. Many congregations complained of unpleasant effluvias and other nasal offenses rising from the ground, which gave rise to the expression stinking rich. Regardless of my affection for the ledger stone, it would be wrong to elevate their status to that of a mural monument, for its purpose was to mark the place of burial and to provide a brief record of the contents of the grave. It was the task of the mural monument to extol the virtues of this deceased. Gradually, over time, the inscription on the ledger took the place of the mural monument and was the only genealogical record of the deceased within the building. The cost of intramural burial, as we have seen from Dr. Morris's account for the burial of his daughter in Wells Cathedral in 1706, was a source of concern to many testators during the 18th and early 19th centuries. And there are frequent references in wills for executors to employ prudence and economy concerning funeral expenses. The standard request was to provide that which is customary, or in other words, in a manner appropriate to their social status and no more. However, the funeral trade also had strict rules as to what was considered customary, which usually meant as much as they could get away with, and it was difficult to escape from their ceremonial. Fortunately for the executors, the majority of funeral furnishers adhered to a sliding scale of panoply, and woe betide the funeral furnisher who provided for a gentleman a funeral of the quality of that ascribed to a baronet, for he was likely to find that once word got out, the baronetage would immediately drop their patronage and go to a more reliable funeral furnisher. Now at present, I've said very little regarding the type of stones used for ledgers. Most of the slabs are quite large, measuring 76 centimetres by 183 centimetres. They were, they were cut in an age of imperial measurements. Those of us in our 50s, 60s and 70s would best identify this as two foot six by six foot. The majority tend to be of black tornai marble, usually brought back by merchant ships as ballast, specifically for sale to monumental masons for ledgers or to specialist builders to create marble floors for grand residential buildings. White Sicilian marble, again imported as slabs, but this time specifically for ledger stones, was the second most popular stone. And there are instances of black marble ledgers with inset plaques of white marble and vice versa. Welsh slate was also a popular material. I would say the best, for it retains the depth of lettering well and is resistant to some extent to wear. In Shropshire and the Welsh borders, cast iron, mainly from Colebrookdale, was popular. Some of the later ledgers, and here I'm thinking of those to Charles Dickens and David Livingstone in Westminster Abbey, and that to Ryder Haggard within St Mary's Ditchingham, Norfolk, brass lettering was used. Others had lettering highlighted with white mastic. But wait a minute, didn't Ryder Haggard die in 1928, 74 years after corporeal intramural burial was banned? Yes, it's true. But if you read it carefully, you'll see his large ledger in the chancel at Ditchingham merely covers the casket containing his cremated remains. There are also a number of instances of ledger stones in freestone, but these should always be considered as a temporary marker, even though some uh, became permanent usually because they marked the burial place of a child from the early years of a couple's married life. And whilst the grave was intended for further deposits and eventually a marble ledger stone, it did not take place, owing to the parents having relocated to another town. The obvious information to be gleaned from the ledger is the life expectancy of the person whom it commemorates. Male life expectancy 
among the middle classes living in towns between 1650 and 1750 averaged 45 years, though in the cities of London and Westminster, this was reduced to 43 years of age. Throughout the 18th century, advances in medical science saw a slight decrease in the death rate, and whilst it was set at 3.9% per annum in the upper middle classes in London between 1675 and 1684, it had dropped to 2.5 per annum by 1795 to 1805. Yet this had little effect on the age of death. In 1845, Edwin Chadwick recorded that for London's gentry, professional persons and their families, the average age of death in the year 1830 was 44. By the middle of the 18th century, churches in the larger towns were beginning to run out of space for uh, ledger capped brick graves. Some of the families who had acquired space in the 17th and early 18th centuries had either died out or, as was more usually the case, had relocated to other parts of the country. From a strictly commercial point of view, this did not help the incumbent. However, as the best judge of his parish, he would have been aware of which families had relocated or died out, and it was not infrequent for their graves, where space permitted, to be used for new burials. But as already been mentioned, it was illegal for him to move a ledger stone from above an existing grave which explains why some ledger stones have additional later inscriptions recording the burial of individuals unrelated to those who had originally purchased the grave. And a goodly number of such examples of this can be seen in St. Nicholas's Chapel of Ease at King's Lynn in Norfolk. But even that space was limited and many an incumbent in the early 19th century may have wondered how he could accommodate the intramural burial of the middling sort in the short term. It was the joint stock private burial grounds of the 1830s that came to the rescue. As I've already mentioned, <clears throat> there was no compunction for an intramural burial to be marked. So a count up of burials recorded on the surviving stones does not provide an accurate record of the number of intramural burials in any given year. For example, in the 1667 burial register for Faxton in Essex, 33 burials are recorded, of which five took place in the church, though none of those are marked. And whilst an incumbent was considered the individual most appropriate to decide who could be buried within the confines of his church, a faculty was still required from the ordinary, which is to say the bishop, for the construction of a brick grave or a burial vault. And as it happened, this was hardly ever the case. For in law, the soil beneath the church was considered part of the incumbent's freehold. And as a brick grave or vault would not materially affect the appearance of the church, it could be argued that no faculty was required and no bishop was going to ask for a test case. Indeed, during the 140 year period of 1690 to 1830, only 26 faculties for vaults were applied for in the London Diocese relating to the County of Essex, 14 of which were confirmatory faculties, which is to say retrospective permission for a vault already constructed. It's to be regretted that very few incumbents account books survive, thus there is no accurate means of establishing the income derived from intramural burial fees. However, church wardens' accounts come to the rescue in some instances. And for example, we know that in 1838, the vicar of St. Giles in the Fields, Westminster, earned 765 pounds from funerals alone, which is equivalent to 78,795 pounds by 2020 standards. And the rector of St. George's, Westminster, a lesser 598 pounds, equivalent to 61,594 pounds by 2020 standards. In 1804, the vicar of Thaxted penned a list of burial fees to the flyleaf of the burial register. He was asking nine pounds, six shillings and fourpence for intramural burial and permission to lay a ledger stone. That's 812 pounds by 2020 standards and double that 
18 guineas, which is 1,624 pounds, if one lived outside the parish. Now to that, the family had to add the cost of creating the grave, say 15,000 pounds by today's standards, another 6,000 for the cost of the ledger stone, cutting the inscription, transporting it to the church and laying it over the grave. And all in all, one was looking at an outlay equivalent today of 21,000, 812 pounds if one lived in the parish, or 22,624 pounds if one came from further afield. And one can see why intramural burial was only affordable by the wealthy. Some fees varied according to the incumbent's knowledge of the individual's wealth. And when Captain John Ferguson was buried in St Mary's Chigwell in 1767, his executors were charged 10 guineas to be forwarded to the vicar for leave to make a vault. And when John Steele was buried in 1770, his executors were asked the same. On the other hand, Thomas Ellis's executors, when he died in 1770, were only asked for five guineas, from which we can deduce that Ellis lived in the parish and that Ferguson and Steele did not. In the main, graves within churches were only cut when the need for burial arose. From a comparison of the dates of death quoted on ledger stones and the dates of the interment given in the burial register for the period 1660 to 1850, the delay between death and burial in a newly made brick grave was five days. Temporary ceiling slabs of freestone were usually provided until such time as the executors were ready to lay the incised ledger. Sometimes these temporary stones were not replaced and ended up as the only marker. On the other hand, many families delayed the provision of a ledger until after the death of the senior member of the family, which is why so many record the father's death first, even though his wife and children had predeceased him. In such churches where space was at a premium, and here I'm thinking especially uh, of St Nicholas's Chapel at Kingsley in Norfolk, it was not unusual for space to be found beneath other um, ancient ledger stones with a new inscription merely being tagged on. Wealthy as these individuals seeking intramural burial were, not all of them could lay claim to a grant of arms. Yes, there are indeed many ledger slabs with armorials, but for those who did not have one, uh, have a particular armorial of their own, they managed to take a, a symbol of death, such as a winged skull or a winged hourglass, which was considered a suitable alternative. Occasionally, some ledgers were cut with a representation of the deceased's coat of arms, though to be truthful, many are known to be spurious and had little, if any, association with the person in the grave. Two particularly fine examples can be seen in St Thomas Salisbury to Jane Eyre, who died in 1695, and her solicitor, uh, her sister uh, Elizabeth, who died in 1705. Fortunately, those who were not armigerous were happy to decide to have nothing at all. The majority of ledgers in uh, England list the grave's contents as a genealogical tree beginning with father and mother and children, which means that these slabs were usually laid after the death of the second parent. But in Northwest Norfolk, there's a tradition where some letter cutters devised a ledger as a double width headstone, which allowed for the husband's uh, inscription to be placed on the, the left-hand side and the wife's on the right. Another example that we can see of this is in uh, the King's Lynn Chapel of St Nicholas's. There are many of these types of slabs where one side is left blank, presumably because the surviving spouse remarried and was buried elsewhere. There were particular places within the church building for certain qualities of individual. Consequently, ledgers over the graves of the clergy are usually to be found in the chancel or sanctuary, though some patrons of the living were also afforded that position. Prominent members of the community are usually to be found either in the centre alley of the nave 
or if they required a more substantial vault, then at the east end of the nave side aisles or at the west end of the church. The spaces in the side alleys of the nave were usually reserved for prominent bachelors and spinsters. But this is merely a general rule and is not necessarily sacrosanct. The majority of inscriptions on ledger stones are in English, but there are some, particularly those commemorating the clergy, <coughs> Excuse me. Particularly those commemorating clergy, which are in Latin. And indeed, there are some Huguenot burials in the city of London and in Norwich, whose ledger stones are inscribed in French. But these are very rare. The standard format of legend begins beneath this stone lies, or here lies the body of. It was standard practice for the font size of the name of the deceased to be larger than that of the rest of the inscription, sometimes in italics, but almost always taking up a single line. Some ledgers begin with HJ, or the fuller hikyakit, which means here lies, or HLD for here lies deposited, which turns up now and again. And to some extent, the use of the initials was a financial saving on the part of the person ordering the ledger for the cost of cutting HLD would have been far less than the 17 letters of here lies deposited when one was being charged by the letter. On the other hand, some ledgers have exceptionally short inscriptions, but this does not mean the lettering is any less crude than those with a longer legend. Probably the shortest would be the name of the deceased and the year of death, such as John Smith, 1801. And some families, continuing well into the 18th century with both ledger and mural monument, uh, leaving the mural monument to record the virtues of the, uh, the, the individual and the ledger marking the place of burial with just an incised initials of the deceased and the year of death on that stone. If you go to Mode in Flintshire, there's a gracious white marble cartouche on the South Isle wall inscribed in memory of Louise Bertrand, who died the 7th of October, 1789, aged 42, and whose remains lie interred in the South Isle, near this place, with a stone over her grave inscribed LB, 1789. Furthermore, the mural monument, if signed by the sculptor, would give a fair indication of the artist responsible for cutting the ledger. As has already been observed, intramural burial was an expensive outlay, almost exclusively reserved to the professional classes. Seeking intramural burial established the local status of the individual, but it was a status which came with a price. To start with, there was the construction of the brick grave to consider. At two meters in length, a meter in width and two meters in depth, this left a fair amount of soil to be disposed of as well as a hefty bill for digging it out and for the bricklayer to line and floor the shaft. Added to this was the purchase of the temporary ledger stone, its transport from the mason's workshop and laying it over the grave. And then there was the expense of having the permanent ledger cut, delivered and set. An expensive enterprise indeed, had one ordered it from the Stantons of Holborn and had it laid over a brick grave in say Bedfordshire or Berkfordshire. But in 2020, the cost of a brick grave on one of the main avenues in London's Kensal Green Cemetery was 50,000 pounds, exclusive of the monument. And this is probably what one had been comparatively paying in the late 18th and early 19th century for an intramural brick grave. Fortunately, we do have some contemporary costings to refer to. And on the 13th of February, 1727, Mr. Rice Williams of Pergo in Essex wrote to his friend Samuel Sands regarding the ledger for his late mother-in-law, Lady Tipping. He writes, upon inquiry, I found that Mr. Thomas Stainer, a stone cutter near Bow Bridge, was the person who laid the stone upon Mrs. Check in Pergo Chapel. He called upon me this morning and I came with him hither in case you and Mr. Archer approve of it. The dimensions of the stone are six foot six by three foot two so that the whole stone will be near 20 square feet, which at 10 shillings a foot 
a penny a letter for cutting, and about three pounds for the coat of arms, brings the whole to about 14 pounds, if you have the same sort of stone as Mrs. Check. If you please to stop on Bowbridge, you may talk with this Mr. Stainer yourselves, as I think he may be brought a little lower in his prices. Well, the comparative value of 14 pounds in 2020 was 2,750, which is rather a little low for a ledger today, as current labour costs are far higher. Nowadays, you'd expect to pay about 12,000 pounds for an inscribed black marble ledger. But whatever the cost, the worst place to set a ledger stone is, I'm afraid to say, into the floor. It gets trampled on, swept on, washed, vacuum polished, abused in a multitude of ways, and consequently, few of them uh, survive in pristine condition. For it was not unusual for the lettering to be coloured or gilded, and the coat of arms to be fully emblazoned. In 1789, the funeral account for Edward Gore of Long Ashton in Somerset records an expenditure of 25 shillings for a covering stone for his brick grave, and a further 30 shillings and sixpence for polishing, gilding, and laying down the stone. In St George's Ailey Street, Aldwych, in the City of London, is an outstanding ledger of the 1730s, its inscription in pristine condition and fully gilded. But this only survived as it was hidden beneath a late 18th century pew plinth. Unfortunately, Edward Gore's stone has long since disappeared, but it was cleared from Ashton Church in 1871 when the floor was relaid. Laying a ledger over a brick grave was a delicate operation, for they were bulky, unwieldy, and exceptionally heavy. Once the temporary stone had been uplifted and discarded, three or more sturdy wooden bars would be placed across the width of the grave, and eight men, each holding four lengths of canvas webbing passing beneath the slab, would move it into position, and with the bars quickly removed, lower it onto the upper tier of bricks of the grave. Subsequent reopenings of a brick grave can often be identified by the chips around the edge of the ledger, where crowbars had been used to uplift it onto wooden rollers for temporary removal. Ledger stones are easy to clean, though water should never be involved. The simplest and most effective way is to vacuum them, having first released the accumulated dust of the centuries from the incised letters by means of a medium hard dry stencil brush. That done, the application of a pure beeswax polish will seal the stone, still allowing it to breathe, and once polished, will bring it up looking as good as it did on the day that it was laid. From then on, a weekly dust with a dry mop will suffice. It should always be remembered that ledgers are works of art in themselves. More so, they cover the resting place of those whom they commemorate. Thus, it is important that they should never be used as a convenient hard surface for the stacking of chairs, nor for flower stands, pianos, drum kits, or sections of staging. And worse, it has been noticed in a church in Northwest Norfolk that they should never be used as a convenient hard standing for a lavatory pod. It is essential, especially in those more rural and isolated churches which do not have heating uh, systems, that ledgers are not covered by carpeting. In cold weather, the burial space beneath a ledger um, yields up dew it is not unusual for the slabs to be powdered with dewdrops in the early morning. If the church has broadloom carpeting over such stone, then this will only lead to rapid decay of the carpet, for which many thanks, Lord. So it's always prudent to let ledgers breathe naturally, or, if necessary, to be covered with rush matting. As you can see here, modern versions of the ledger are occasionally to be seen in cathedrals rather than churches, marking the burial place of the ashes of the deceased, as at Bristol Cathedral. The system continues at Westminster Abbey, a royal peculiar outside of Episcopal jurisdiction, and one of the most recent to C.S. Lewis by the young letter cutter Wayne Hart is surely a ledger to die for. I trust that I've been able to show 
that ledgers are not quite as boring as some would have us believe, and that these so-called ugly ducklings will one day acquire their glorious plumage and become, if not swans, then at least the mallards of funerary sculpture. Julian, thank you so much. That was a um, fantastic, fantastic lecture. I'm just going to stop your screen sharing mode and we're going to go into question time very, very shortly. Everyone, I hope you um, enjoyed that lecture. I know I've learned a lot um, about ledger stones, which I, I have to confess, I didn't know um, very much about them until this lecture. So thank you so much, Julian. Um, that no was such an enlightening lecture. Everyone, um, thank you for your comments already. Before we go into um, question time, just a reminder, if you've enjoyed this free lecture, um, please do consider making a donation. You can text us, um, you can text CCT to 70331 to give us a gift of three pounds. You can donate um, any amount you wish to um, through our website, which is visitchurch.org.uk, or you can join us as a member. As I said at the start, we're doing a special membership offer at the moment. Um, if you join us by direct debit, um, which is just £3.50 a month, um, and if you use the offer code LECTURE, and that's LECTURE in capitals, you'll get a free copy of this book, The Secret Language of Churches and Cathedrals, which um, thank you to those of you who've already got it and been commenting how much you like it. Um, do comment away, everyone, who have got this. Tell me what your favourite chapter is, because um, we're working on some content um, around people's favourite chapters about this book. So do um, let us know. But as I said, if you join by direct debit from just £3.50 a month um, and use that off code lecture, you'll get a free copy of this. But also during the year, you'll be getting copies of our exclusive um, um, members magazine, Pinnacle. And I'm pleased to say it's hot off the press. It only arrived yesterday. It's our latest magazine. Um, so all of our current members will be getting a copy of this very shortly. And this gives you behind the scenes um, look into the work of the Church's Conservation Trust, some of our um, work. So um, you, can, you can read more about our annual appeal and um, some of the amazing craftspeople we have. I had the... This one um, is from um, just a workshop just outside Shrewsbury where we're doing some work on the pinnacles and you'll be able to see one of the films that we went and filmed there very shortly. But you, it's a really great little resource and a great magazine to read. So as I said, if you join us by direct debit and use that off code lecture, you get a free copy of that. Now, um, if you've got questions, everyone, now's your time to comment away. I see we've had lots coming already, so I'm gonna dive straight in. So Julian, the first question, um, I'm going to ask you if that's okay. Is what did the funeral service look like? Um, was there a difference between people who had a funeral inside if they were buried inside the church versus those who were buried no. outside? As far as the liturgy was concerned, nothing, uh, no differential between all of them. They all had the 1662 Book of Common Prayer right for the uh, the burial of the dead. The only differential that you would have seen would have been the quality of the clothing that the individuals themselves were wearing and also to the luxury of the coffin itself. The majority of the coffins that were destined for vault and brick grave deposit were triple coffins of wood, lead and wood. There was no such thing as a lead line coffin then. Please don't accept one these days. A lead line coffin is the B&Q and Ikea of funerary deposits. And the outer wooden case would have been covered in black velvet with rows of uh, brass uh, studs all over it. Uh, if you uh, remember the nobility, your external covering to, to that outer wooden case would have been in crimson velvet. But, and, and, but then of course you wouldn't have seen it because that coffin itself would have been put up on the shoulders of six or eight of the undertaker's men. They were the coffin bearers. And over it would have been thrown a 12 foot by 15 foot black velvet pall the hems of which on the, 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 the longer sides of the coffin would, would have been held up by friends of the deceased. And it was they who were called pallbearers. Nowadays, if a funeral, you go to organize a funeral with a funeral director and they say, how many pallbearers would you like? Be clever, say none, because you're not having a pall, you want coffin bearers. Thank you, I didn't even know that about pallbearers. So that's another new yeah. interesting fact I've learned today. Thank you, Julian. Um, I'm going to ask another question here. Um, well, before I do, um, it was really interesting you just said about the, um, the coffins having studs in and fabric. Um, we shared everyone that there was a lecture a few weeks ago where we looked at our church at St. Swithin's Worcester, where we'd be doing a awful amount of work as it's a regeneration project with us here at the Trust, and we're turning it into an arts and um, music venue. And we did some work um, there where we had to do some work on the ledger stones, and we had to remove um, some, and we discovered some vaults. 
And as you said, Julian, we, when we lifted up the ledgers, we found some really interesting, incredibly well-preserved um, coffins with some beautiful engraved um, plaques on top of those. So um, everyone, if you'd like to read a blog about that, comment away and I'll get um, one of our members of staff that will put a blog together because I know they've been put, putting some research together about it, but it's fantastic social history, everyone looking at this. Um, are there any um, recorded instances of disputes over between the gentry and the expanding middle classes over space for intramural burials? How interesting. I would think you would, that wouldn't obviously have happened after the, let, let's say 1857, when we, we had the establishment of, of cemeteries. Uh, also too, there were more discrepancies between conformists and non-conformists. If you go into a, a churchyards and, and have a look at some of these more grandiose chest tombs with railings around them, it may well be that they commemorate uh, wealthy nonconformists who, whilst they uh, did have a right to be buried within the, the churchyard in their own vaults, did not have a right to go within the church building itself. And indeed, I'm sure everyone has seen instances of where there are mural monuments on the exterior of a church building. And that again, usually is the, uh, the situation where it commemorates a person who was a nonconformist rather than somebody who was of the Church of England. That, I wouldn't so much say there was a rivalry in any way. I think there was just a common understanding that that's how it was going to be. Thanks, Julian. And um, I think an interesting point someone's made is, um, I suppose the most famous ledge stone could be that of Jane Austen in, Winter, in Winchester Cathedral. Um, do you agree with that? Because I'm not sure. If, do, do any of the recent royal family members buried in St George's Chapel Winter have ledge stones? Yes, they do. They do. Um, <clears throat> it's a well-known one. I wouldn't say the most famous. Before. We probably haven't found the most famous one yet. As far as I'm concerned, they're all important because they all commemorate individuals who, like us, form part of society. The additional thing is to, they tell us a little bit more than that they were just Fred Smith. It tells us what they did. It's usually Fred Smith, solicitor, or Joseph Ebenezer, who was um, a, a lawyer, a common pleas. This is the important thing that they tell us. But um, well known, Yes, I agree that it, that uh, Jane, that, that, that particular mon monument to Jane is is well known, only because it has been trumpeted. It's like most well known things, isn't it? But I'm sure if we went to some of the more rural churches in England and started looking at all of the ledgers, we'd find some that were as eloquent and as elegant in execution. I think that's a really nice point there to make. You know that these uh, tell stories about people. And I think you're absolutely right there. Um, You've obviously talked about uh, and you've dedicated lots of time yourself personally to researching Ledgestones. Do, do you have any ideas for why Ledgestones have been so little researched and why, as you said, some people might find them a bit boring? Hmm, how interesting. I haven't given much thought to that, probably because if you walk into a building, that which catches your eye visually is the high altar, the stained glass and the monuments. You never look down to see what's, what's underneath. It's much like my aversion to, to carpeting I've always wondered why it is that there's a length of red carpet that goes down the church. And most of your time when you're in the building is spelt within the pews and there's no carpets there. Why put something down that you're only going to walk on for 25 seconds before you sit down for an hour? But there we are, that's because I'm eccentric. So. <laughs> No, my views on um, blue upholstered chairs in churches are very well known. So uh, no, I can agree with you to, on some uh, ideas about carpet, said Julian. Um, so there, I'm quite interested in your thoughts on this question. Were spurious coats of arms more prevalent around Queen Victoria's reign? I would think there were more of them around in the 18th century, believe you me. You only had to try and f match something to, to your name. What if your surname was Bell? Eh? My goodness, the inventions that they did. At that particular time, there were volumes around uh, that were showing um, the, the, the grants of arms of, of armigerous families. And I suppose all you have to do is look up anybody who had the surname Bell and you think, oh, I must be related to them because I'm the solicitor. And so you copy it and put it onto, on, on, onto your slab. Very naughty, it really is. But it was more common in the 18th century than it was in the 19th. Thanks, Julian. I think we've got time for a couple more questions, but um, um, someone's asked, um, what is the earliest and uh, earliest known and best preserved ledger stone in you, that you can think of? Mm. 
they change. Thank you for that question. Because remember that there's a transition between the um, monumental brass in the, the, the floor and also the, uh, the ledger stone as we know it. There are some of the, uh, the late um, uh, 16th, early, very early 17th century that have inscriptions that only go around the edge almost as if they're waiting for the monumental brass to come to be put in the center. Those I would say are the ones to look out for. They're now known as incised slabs rather than ledger stones per se. But uh, if you find one of those, my goodness, what a humdinger, you really are lucky. And um, do you know what happened to ledger stones when a church was rebuilt? Yes, sometimes they were retained. Because remember, if you're going to rebuild the church, you want to be very careful with what you're doing with, the, with those who are underneath it. Uh, and it's, it's better to understand that if you're going to do a rebuild, that if you've got a hard standing already, which is your floor, leave it, just a rebuild around it. But yes, quite a lot of ledgers were, were taken out and uh, brick graves were infilled with soil. And the ledgers tended to be used either as uh, path for pathways leading up to the porch from the perimeter of the, the churchyard, or as uh, happened a great Massingham in Norfolk, they were all bunched together in the churchyard at the east end of the, uh, of the chancel. And I think we've got time for one final question, Julian. I often ask our lecturers this, um, if they've got a favorite, but do you have a favorite ledger stone and a particular reason why it's your favorite? No, none, they're all favorites because I like all of them. And I'm grateful to the people beneath who decided that they would wish to have a ledger stone to commemorate themselves, which allowed me to do the research on them. Thank you. I think that's a wonderful, wonderful answer. And uh, I'm sure everyone, you know, watching will, you know, join me in thanking you because um, it really has been a tremendous lecture and we've learned so much. So thank you for giving your time freely today to help us um, educate people about ledger stones. So um, everyone, if you've enjoyed today's lecture, please comment away. If you've joined us for the first time, Again, a welcome. I hope you've enjoyed it. Um, do comment away and let's, let me know what you thought. Now, next week, um, we're, um, so this month um, of August, we've been doing lectures on um, church monuments. So last week, we're joined by Jessica Barker from the Courtauld Institute of Art in London, who did a talk on stone fidelity. This week, Dr. Julian Lytton has kindly talk, joined us to talk about ledger stones. The next week, we're joined by the chairman of the Church Monument Society, Mark Downing. Now, Mark is going to be talking to us about medieval-ish effigies of the York Sage. Um, it's going to be, Mark is a real expert on armour and effigies. I've met Mark a couple of times, we did some filming together, and um, he wrote a blog for us. This, um, this month's uh, Church um, Monuments of the Month blog, Mark wrote for us at the Trust, and uh, he, he's a real expert, so do join us next Thursday for that lecture. Um, if you are already a member, or if you join us as a member, you get access to all of our recordings. And this, um, on Monday evening, we had um, Dr. Jean Wilson, also from the Church Monument Society, gave a phenomenal talk about um, church monuments. So um, you'll get access to that if you became a member of us. But everyone, comment away. Let me know um, what future lecture topics you'd like us to explore. Um, I hope you've enjoyed this lecture. But everyone, thank you for joining us today. Um, I hope you have a great week ahead. But um, again, thank you so much, Julian. Um, it has been a pleasure. And um, yes, thank you so much.